such a warm welcome. And thank you again for your support in um, my being sick last week. I'm, like I said, 100% better. Uh, and I'm excited to continue with you on this topic uh, of heart brain coherence and restorative justice practices. This is session two. And um, we're going to dive right in with a brief coherence practice in just one moment. But I wanted to take a moment also to, since we've had a, a pause in between sessions, just do a few quick little um, so-called business items. So the first one is, as was noted in your email update, that we will tack on another session beyond our schedule to make up for last week. So that's the first item. And then the second item is, please don't forget your resource Padlet and um, that you have that available to you and that there's some really wonderful, I, I believe, um, materials there. They're not required. There's no requirements to this course and, and series and interactive. However, I think you might find the PDF on uh, that, that's, that came directly from studies and research from um, medical doctors and scientists from the HeartMath Institute. You'll find that PDF posted on your Padlet. Is anyone having trouble with the Padlet? I just want to make to make sure to answer any questions you might have about that before we open up today. And everybody knows that the Padlet 2 uh, will not expire, so it's there for you. And I also would just like to invite you to share this information with people. Um, it's not restorative justice on the rise's copyright. It's uh, a conglomeration of materials that I have been lucky enough to learn over the last 20 years in my work at the Institute of Noetic Sciences and working alongside some of the people that founded HeartMath, um, not like directly with them, but having them come visit our campus and learning more about what they're doing from lectures that they provided. And so I feel very privileged and responsible in conveying this information, but I want you to feel welcome to pass it along um, and also to recommend restorative justice on the rise. Uh, I, uh, one thing I quickly would like to mention is that our website is very outdated right now and does not reflect the wealth of um, resources and classes online mostly that we have offered over the last two and a half years, three years and beyond. And, um, I am looking for another intern and someone who can help with getting things up to speed. So I'm kind of putting that out there to um, the community that it would be great if you know someone who might be interested in uh, possibly starting out as a part-time volunteer. I'm looking for someone that can help update the website and help with marketing and outreach so that um, we can focus on bringing back uh, a lot more of our faculty into the weave again. There's a lot of admin that needs to be done to update. So um, it's a it's a fun opportunity. Um, the person that I'd like to work with would be interested, of course, in the local and global field and not afraid of some of these edge topics as well, so to speak, edge topics. So thank you if you know of anybody. Please pass that word along. and. Um, uh, lastly, um, just a reminder too that that there is a robust um, podcast at iTunes and Spotify, and we will hope to add our recent European interviews there. If you're interested, we had conversations with people from the European Forum for Restorative Justice and um, discovered a lot about what's going on in the European Union as far as restorative justice practices. Um, I made an interesting discovery that there really aren't any restorative justice departments in universities in Europe, and that um, there seems to be only just a slight emergence right now in the EU of official restorative justice programs like the ones we have here in Colorado. So 
um, the Colorado programs and coalition. If anyone is more is interested in more information about what has happened over the last 20 to 30 years here in Colorado, um, thanks to many, many people who have been very devoted cross profession to um, implementing and continuing to refine practices in schools and alongside and with courts, please um, let me know. Um, there is such a wealth and abundance of resources, um, videos, interviews, information about bills and um, uh, practices that it, it, I'm, I'm definitely wanting to help people get, uh, if, if you want it, a more of an understanding of just how far we have come in the United States. And of course, we also have a lot of a lot of growth <laughs> that we, we can do. But restorative justice is not just, of course, about conflict and harm. It's about connection. And I'm super excited to be here with you again. And we will, of course, continue on um, to session three next week. And uh, please save September 21st as our makeup session time for, from last week. And I just want to welcome those of you that have come in the door, so to speak, um, this morning as I was doing a few business items. Welcome to Christine and Ron, Jackie, Sharon, George, Kendall, and uh, Linda. And we'll have a chance to say hello to each other in just a moment. We're going to take some time to connect, but I'd love to open up today and go into the simple heart brain coherence practice and hear from a medical doctor about some of the things that we began to cover in our first session. So we're going to do a little bit of a um, stepping a, a back to two weeks ago with this MD who I think does a great job um, capsuling what heart math is and the practices and the science behind it. And then we'll, um, after we practice right now, we'll do that. And then we'll go back to our presentation and more evidence and how it relates and links to restorative practices. So good morning again. Good morning, everybody. It's a privilege and pleasure to see your wonderful faces. And let's do a quick coherence together. And just, I'd invite you, um, if you would, I like to take a mental note of how I'm feeling uh, pre-practice and post-practice. So, um, if you feel resonant with doing so, um, take a mental note right now, of just kind of where you're at this morning as you've entered in to the room here together and anything that might be feeling a little bit maybe less than optimal or not so centered. Just take a, a gentle observational point of view on that. Okay. And again, this is an, an invitation, not a directive. And uh, values of these um, spaces that we are in together are certainly to uphold your comfort in how you would wish to participate. So that is, of course, um, your choice. Quick coherence is a simple yet powerful technique that you can use to connect more deeply with your own heart and to connect more with the hearts of others. Let's try it together. First step is to focus your attention on the area of your heart. Just shift your focus to the area of your chest or heart. And pretend like your breath is flowing in through the area of the heart or chest and out through the area of the heart. Breathe a little more slowly, a little more deeply, than you normally do, maybe to a count of five in and five out, but find a smooth, easy rhythm. Let's do it.
Now continue this heart focused breathing and make a sincere attempt to re experience a positive or regenerative feeling like the care or appreciation you have for someone or something in your life. It could be a pet, a time in nature, a special place, an accomplishment, but feel that genuine feeling of love you have for someone or care or appreciation. Or just focus on a feeling of calm and ease as you continue the heart focus breathing. Now this technique, quick coherence, is putting your heart rhythms into a more coherent mode, a coherent rhythm, and it has a carryover effect. So as you move into your next activities or connect with someone, you can feel more heart connected, more centered. You can do this simple one minute technique anytime, anywhere. Would anyone like to share um, about how that might help shift for them um, comparative to when you arrived this morning? Did you notice a difference of any kind just with that quick technique? I'll speak up if you can hear me. Can you hear me? This is Carolyn. Good morning, Carolyn. Yes, please. I am driving back from a meeting at a school, and uh, so I was feeling in a very hectic state, and my Wi-Fi went out because uh, I was on a backcountry road and disconnected from you. So when I came back, you were doing the quick coherence, and it really helped center me. It really did. I just thought of, of my relatives that I appreciate so much and uh, just got to spend some time with, and it put me right back into a less hectic zone. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. This is George. Uh, this is George. I first of all, I'm pleased to meet everybody. I've been watching but not attending the class. Uh, it, it does help center. You know, when you when you're going to a classroom, I guess is our virtual room, you're more focused on getting there, getting the thing to work. You know, wondering is this going to work this time? You know, did I miss the did I miss the memo about it got canceled? You know, that, that you're sort of focused on everything else but your own self, and it it does help to reminds you that that's part of it you're in the room with everyone else and how you feel about your own being is it really does help i mean i i maybe i shouldn't be so surprised but i am you know it does it 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 just not to say it works it just sort of helps me figure out why you know first of all to be more attentive but also just to figure out what okay you're here now what are you doing here kind of thing so i, I like that that was really good mm. So great to see you, George, and thank you for being here. Um, I'd love to, like, optionally, your choice, if you'd like to say where you're from and anything about yourself, since it's your first time with us. I, I'm attending from Rochester, Minnesota, a part of the Three Rivers Restorative Justice Program. And so that's why that's where I live. And, and we're, we're in our homes. We uh, where Our intent was to try to get together at, at the offices for Three Rivers, but they were having problems with Wi-Fi, so that didn't work out today. But I think that would also be valuable to me to to be in the same room with with the other people because I really value that. I mean, I value their company, and I also like looking at their faces and watching their body language as well. So that's I can't quite do that here, but I I I'm here because this is a topic that is very very important to me. I had volunteered as a as a facilitator. But there's a whole lot, just a whole lot to restorative justice I don't understand. And I'm just hoping to gain just a better idea on some of the background, how it gets practiced other places, because that's also really in of interest to me. And I don't know, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll let uh, Kendall comment more about this, but it's probably going to be something that in the state of Minnesota is going to be expanding. And just to understand a little bit more about how it gets explained to other people or, or listening to the explanations of it helps me get a little bit more insight into my own understanding of it. So that's invaluable. And I thought, by the way, the first session, the only one I was at 
was really good. I mean, it really helps. I, I more than I thought. So great. Thank you. Thank you so much, George. I'm really honored and, and delighted to hear that this has been supportive for you. And um, like I said earlier, for anyone who would like to know more about how things look and feel on the ground um, because of the decades of movement happening in Colorado. And again, um, everybody knows that there's growth points here and hopefully are willing in policy and practice to continue to refine those. But um, we've really made headway in schools um, as well as very much so alongside and with courts. And I, I think I may have mentioned, I was a director of a program alongside and with courts and had the privilege of hearing both skepticism and um, very open support of the practices. So I've learned a lot myself and I continue to learn. Anyone else care to share about what, what did you notice about um, how you felt before we did that practice and maybe any shift for you? And if you're just here for the first time, again, welcome. And um, anything else that anyone would like to make known about, about uh, you, even if you weren't here or were here two weeks ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd just like to say that uh, it's helpful just to see and in, in 60 seconds how that can help create a shift. I, I have the uh, fairly consistent practice every morning going down to the river behind our house and, and doing a, a meditation centering time down there and, and you know, on the yoga mat and, and all. And it's beautiful to be able to do that. Uh, this morning, I woke up to news that a, a dear family friend who had been ill for a long time had passed away and responding to that and had if I already had two Zoom meetings this morning. Um, and so just didn't have have time to do that. And so very grateful for that in a 60 second period was able to gain some of that centering and peace that um, it's necessary. I just. Um... Excuse me. Excuse me. Go ahead. I, I was just saying. I, I just appreciate um, being in a group where we really take time to do that, and that that's part of the process, and and feeling supported in that. I I appreciate doing it. Thank you. I was noticing just doing it today. Um, I feel very aware of the relationships or uh, people that are difficult for me right now and challenging. And so just taking a moment to really kind of flip that and um, take in all of the people that I appreciate so much and that are so meaningful to me and so supportive and helpful to me feels like an important part of that kind of negativity bias work and taking time to really remember all of the good stuff, which is of course not where our brains always automatically go because we're so good at finding the problems. Um, so that that's what was sticking out to me today. Wow, thank you for transparency about that. And um, what brings to mind is something that we could practice together um, that is very, similar to this quick practice, but it's about, um, and it's sort of like Tong Len, if you're familiar with Tong Len, uh, for difficult people that we're working with, um, that you know are very much human beings with hearts and situations just like us. Um, so I, I would be happy to offer that. We, we will do a palette of practices throughout this series. So I want to interact with you on what your needs would be. I'm, I'm guessing that school practices would be a good, good one as well, which I believe were promised anyway in the invitation to register. 
Anyone else? Thank you so much, Jackie. It's good to see you. I'm Christine. I'm joining from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Um, and uh, for me, that I use a three breath practice. This, this was very similar. I think I had almost three breaths. Um, but we use this practice in staff meetings, um, after different sessions with clients, just as a way to reset. So sometimes I think about all of the energy in our bodies, like my computer, and how sometimes the computer just needs a little reboot. So the three breaths for me is that little reboot. Wonderful. It's so simple, isn't it? It does make a difference for you. Yes. It's great to see you, Christine, and thank you for being here. And um, your your um, sharing reminds me of uh, James Nestor's work. Is anyone familiar with James Nestor, the author of Breath? Um, I highly recommend it. It's a book that basically is a study on um, proper breathing and that, that we actually as a humanity are not breathing properly. <laughs> and what a, a, a gigantic difference proper breath can make, just that. And I, you know, this is not news to you, I'm sure, but, but maybe James Nestor would be of interest. He also does, uh, I'm currently reading, actually here's his book. Um, this is a book, uh, his, I believe his first, um, and it's about uh, the science of breath really. And in extreme deep, uh, deep diving, um, they can go down 300 feet and back on only one breath. So there's 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 a lot of science and study that we just haven't even really touched the tip of the iceberg around. And that's why this is so exciting to me to be in this with you. And so this is a very good book for a lot of different reasons. Um, and it does relate to breath practice, but other things as well um, around the topic that we're gonna venture into um, about the science of listening um, this book doesn't talk about listening necessarily, but it's related, uh, definitely related. Um, the, the pieces of our um, capacities that we're, we're underusing or not even aware of really is the point. Anyone else? Give. Oh yes, thanks. I will definitely put that recommended reading in. Would you like it in the chat? And uh, I can put it in the bibliography of our slides, which I'm I'm going to be posting. I just didn't want us to get ahead of ourselves too much. Okay. Um, just wanting to make sure everybody got a chance to voice in. So let's go ahead and shift gears gently over to Dr. Jennifer and her excellent, uh, this is actually a 20 minute video, um, but it's well worth it. Um, she really capsules heart math and heart coherence in a way that I really like. And I think you will probably too. Um, so let's go ahead and go into that. And then when we come back, we'll have a little reflection time and then more presentation. And of course, always an invitation for um, interaction and discussion at any point, just simply voice in at the chat or otherwise. So I introduce to you, Jennifer May and uh, this excellent video on an overview of the science of what we're talking about and discussing throughout this series. Hey guys, it's Dr. May. How are you going today? Um, I wanted to share uh, with you um, a technique called heart math that I learned a couple of years ago. And I found it's been a great addition to my mindfulness practice. And I wanted to tell you about it because it's based in science and it could help a lot. 
and um, it's nearly not that hard to do. Okay, so uh, that's the goal for today. Here we go, art math. Don't worry, you don't have to get a calculator or anything like that, okay? It, don't worry about addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, all that business, okay? So it's just the title, it's just the official name of this, this science of this technique, okay? So uh, don't get scared off. Um, so, whoop, there we go. Okay, so I'm gonna start out with um, some of the science first, and then I'm gonna move into the techniques, okay? So try to understand the background about it, I think, kind of gives you a sense of why we're doing it and may help with the motivation to want to give it a try, okay? So uh, bear with me. So fun facts about the heart, okay? So um, because we're working with the heart-brain connection in this one, mind-body connection. Okay, so would you know that in a fetus, right, like an unborn baby, the fetal heart starts beating before the brain and the nervous system are fully developed, right? So the heart is the first major thing to develop in your in your body as you're just a little wee thing, right? Um, and the heart has its own nerve cells, similar to those found in the brain. So there's literally like a heart brain that we have, okay? And did you know that your heart actually sends your brain nine times more messages than your brain sends your heart? So sometimes you literally feel something or intuit something with your heart first, and then you think about it, right? So it, there really is some kind of heart action going on, you know? And another cool thing is that the heart has a really big electromagnetic field. So if you look at that picture on the bottom right, it could be measured six to eight feet from your body, right? So our body actually, like our cells don't really end with our skin. Like part of our cells is our energy. And the heart electromagnetic field energy sends a way, way, way far away from our body, right? So that's kind of cool, right? Okay. Um, sorry, it's having a hard time turning today. Okay, there's a concept they call entrainment, okay? And so your heart has the strongest rhythm in the whole body. And when your heart beats a certain way, everything else syncs up to your heart. Your heart's like the conductor. And then the other organs in your body, like your brain and your breathing and stuff, are kind of like the players in the orchestra, right? So when the conductor conducts a certain way, everybody follows, right? So when your heart sets the tone, all the other parts of your body follow, okay? So that's entrainment, okay? And heart rate variability. This is another kind of um, measure that they look at, and high heart rate variability is considered to be healthy, okay? So basically it varies because there's little micro changes between your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous systems. So basically the parasympathetic nervous system is what they call like the rest and digest. So it kind of helps slow things down, right? Sympathetic prepares us for action like fight or flight. So it revs things up, right? So there's little micro shifts between those two and a, like a moment to moment basis. And those are reflected in the intervals between each heartbeat. So your heart literally doesn't beat like a metronome, like exactly the same every time. Like there's a slightly different amount of space between each heartbeat. And that's a good thing because it reflects like a sensitive system that when you really can make those micro changes back and forth between rest and digest and fight or flight, it's really showing your body's flexible and able to adapt to circumstances. So you want a good heart rate variability. It's a sign of health, okay? So, um, Heart math actually helps with this, and we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, next. Okay, so actually, here's some benefits of high heart rate variability. So you actually have a greater sense of well-being and better physical performance. So it makes you feel better about yourself, and you could actually perform better, like if you're doing sports or other kinds of physical activities, right? Better cognitive performance, like so is better thinking ability that are able to reason wisely. Hmm, that sounds pretty good, right? Um, it helps you sleep better and it helps you relax and recover better, right? And also gives you greater resilience, which is back, bouncing back from stress, right? Because it has more variability between the rest and digest and the fight or flight, more flexibility, right? Because it's a sign of flexibility and adaptability. So all these things are signs of health, right? Anytime you hear flexibility, think that's healthy, right? A flexible approach to a situation is always a healthy approach. All right, so high heart rate variability, good for all these things. Okay, next, 
Um, on the other hand, a low heart rate variability is associated with a host of problems. So we're trying not to have a low heart rate variability. So you tend to be more tired and depressed. You have less adaptability to circumstances, right? So you kind of like that stubborn mule. Maybe you're a little bit rigid about things. And you have more health problems and risk of death. Oh, well, that's not good, right? Trying to stay alive here. Okay. Uh, another concept they talk about with heart math is heart coherence, right? So if you're talking about somebody you're interacting with and you say they're coherent, what does it mean? It basically means that they're making sense, right? They're talking in a coherent manner so you could follow along with what they're saying. So when your heart is coherent, it's making sense within your body, right? And that's a good thing. So that's symbolized by, on the right, that green box that I put there. So if you look at that flow, right, it's a nice flow, a nice wave, right? And that's a sign of heart, heart coherence when they measure your heartbeat, okay? So it's about heart, I'm sorry, it's about order, harmony, and stability, okay? And it means that the sympathetic and parasympathetic branches are nice and synchronized. And that's a good thing, right? We want them working together well. Um, so when you have good heart coherence, there's a host of benefits, right? So this is also something that's helped by heart math. So it helps us to remember, learn, focus, and process information. So just like the heart rate variability, it helps with our cognitive functioning, right? Because our heart feeds to our brain, gives us more efficient use of our energy, um, has more order and harmony in our physiological processes, right? Because remember, the heart's like the conductor and it, it affects all the other physical aspects of our body. and it increases our emotional stability and self-regulation, right? So if we're working on emotion regulation, we want a little car coherence there, right? Okay, so um, other hand, heart incoherence, right? So if someone's talking in an incoherent manner, that means like they're not really making a lot of sense. So if you look at the waves on the left side in that red box, they're kind of all over the place, right? They're kind of jaggedy and random. So they're kind of incoherent, right? They're it's really not very healthy here. So um, here the sympathetic and the parasympathetic branches are kind of out of sync. They're not really working well together. And that's not very healthy for us at all, okay? Our body kind of operates much more inefficiently. So it's kind of like the guy in that picture on the bottom left, like he's drained of his battery, right? This extra wear and tear on our system. It like depletes our energy. It's really not very good for us at all, right? It also negatively affects our vision listening ability, reaction time, and even our mental clarity, feeling states and sensitivity. So there's an emotional effect too, right? Affects our cognition, affects our feelings, right? So that's not really a great sign, right? So we're trying to, again, reduce the incoherence, increase the, the coherence, and also increase the heart rate variability, okay? All right, I hope this isn't too sciencey for you, um, but it, it kind of makes a little sense, I hope, right? Okay. So now check this out. I'm gonna bring this a little bit more into the emotional realm, okay? Which is a little bit more my wheelhouse, okay? So your emotions and your heart, as you probably can guess, go hand in hand, okay? So when we're experiencing positive emotions, such as love, care, appreciation, compassion, joy, et cetera, okay? And we breathe and focus on our heart, it creates a positive effect. It improves our heart rate variability and our heart coherence, okay? And it feeds that back to our brain. And then we're more likely to be in a wise mind, right? So what's wise mind all about? We're a little more rational, focused, balanced, um, clear. You're understanding things better. We're maybe more hopeful and optimistic, right? And all that's a good, healthy sign, right? So if we want to get into wise mind, we need to work on our heart a little bit, okay? Okay. On the other hand, negative emotions and stress, right? So if we're feeling things like anger, frustration, anxiety, you know, and we're kind of run down with stress and things like that, now poor heart rate variability and heart incoherence, that feeds back to our brain. And what happens? We can't think so clearly and make wise decisions. Now we're probably an emotional mind. We're not really, you know, using our cognitive resources to the best of our ability. Okay, see, see how this is all fitting together? Okay, now check this out. Here's some more fun facts, okay? Heart-to-heart -heart communication. So you know how we talked about that the heart creates a big electromagnetic field around us? So when we're near each other, they kind of overlap, 
right? And one person's heart coherence could actually help another person achieve coherence, right? So our hearts, our heart incoherence or coherence influences the people around us without us even having to touch them, right? Pretty interesting. Check this out. This is an experiment they did. So the three people on the left, top, and right were trained in heart math, okay? So they were trained to create on purpose a coherent heart rhythm, okay? Then they bring in um, a participant in the study who doesn't know anything about heart math. So this person sits down and just by being around the other three people without knowing anything about heart math, this person's heart rate became more coherent, right? So you actually could have that influence on each other because of those overlapping electromagnetic fields. Pretty cool, right? Okay, here's even another cool thing that humans and animals could affect each other's you know, heart rate variability and heart coherence, okay? So um, this boy, Josh, has a dog named Mabel, okay? And Josh was trained in um, heart math, so he knows how to purposely make his heart coherent, okay? So what happened was they started out in separate rooms and they measured each of their, you know, heart coherence. So as you could see on the bottom, so Mabel's um, and Josh's um, heart coherence was, was incoherent, right? It started out kind of jagged, right? Then Josh entered the room with his dog, with Mabel, and he practiced um, heart math, okay? So he made his rhythm more coherent. And just by being with him, Mabel's heart rate became more coherent, okay? And then when Josh left the room, they both became incoherent again, okay? So we could even influence our pets that way. Pretty cool. All right. All right. So how can heart math help? Okay. So heart math, you could actually use it like a mindfulness practice. Okay. It's probably very similar to some that you've even done before, but not even thought of it as heart math. Okay. So it's kind of like meditation-like techniques that are scientifically proven. It's based in science that improve both heart coherence and heart rate variability. Okay. And by doing that, we then could help us uh, regulate our emotions, our cognition, our physical health, and even our relationships. All right, so a lot of good benefits with no side effects at all, okay? Now, I'm gonna go over a few techniques with you briefly. Um, there's a few videos online that go over some of these, but it's a little hard to find. So I just want you to be aware of them. And if you need to screenshot it, just to keep it clear for yourself, that's, that's cool. Maybe you could have someone do it with you or you could bring it to a DBT group or something, but I'll just kind of give you the rundown. Okay, so there's one technique, which is the simplest and the easiest, okay? It's called the quick coherence technique. It only takes a few minutes and it creates, you know, the heart rate variability and the heart, heart coherence. I mean, good heart rate variability and heart coherence. So um, all you have to do is first, you know, kind of slow down, sit down, get your head straight, focus your attention on your heart, right? Just put your mind there, slow down your breath, Imagine breathing through your heart. So imagine your breath here instead of where it usually is. And then just bring up a feeling of care or appreciation. Think about someone or something you love. Bring up those positive feelings. <laughs> Excuse me. Sorry, my throat's a little dry. Okay, and then you just sit with that for a couple of minutes. I just would like to pause for a moment and add a few details that I myself have learned um, from teachers of this very simple practice. And the first point is um, from Rita Marie Johnson, who is an extraordinary guide um, using what she calls the connection practice. And she has integrated heart math and nonviolent communication into what she calls the connection practice and has been sharing it with the world um, through the Rosser Foundation and um, doing peace work for decades. So she's one of my teachers in this. And she says it's very, very important that on um, number three, bringing up that feeling of care or appreciation to think of someone or something you love that, that we really, um, feel confident that it's 100%, that there's, there's no um, static or confusion at all, that that is uh, 100 to 1000 or more percent positive. 
So um, just being discerning about what um, what you're bringing in as a memory. Um, for example, that you may think of a loved one that that really brings you comfort and happiness, and yet perhaps um, they passed away and you still have grief about that. And that's that inhibits a full blown feeling in your your physical mental awareness of um, positivity. And grief is not a bad thing, of course. It's a very important um, part of, of being here in this world. However, in this particular practice, um, she recommends, and this is my interpretation of it, not, not necessarily quoting her, that, that we ensure that we're bringing in something that feels completely purely positive. Uh, because it, what it does is it helps us to um, really build a strong foundation for all of our systems that we're engaging in this way to um, begin to rewire and to begin to um, be receptive to, to this practice, even when we're, as many, if not all of us are, on the go. So um, I think I, the point I made uh, perhaps two weeks ago is one that I continuously make, and that's that, that the, the idea is here that we start with this very simple technique. We do it really well, um, and it builds a groundwork, a frame for you to do it on the fly. Um, as the more we do this regularly uh, in our own way, however that may be daily or regularly, whatever that means to you, the more that we will be prepared as specific to restorative justice or whatever kind of work or attention we're giving and involved in in that moment of our lives, we'll be able to draw upon this practice without really even thinking too much about it. It will become a part of our, um, is it the parasympathetic or the sympathetic? The one that's automatic, that you know beats our heart, that breathes our lungs. So the idea is that we're really integrating it at that level um, and in this way. So that, that's one of my goals here for us together is to really get a sense deeply of this practice um, this simple practice, the quick coherence, and to to expand on it um, from a really good foundation. So and this um, description and video, I just love it because she's very clear and coherent about what it means. Um, I'm just trying to think of any other points here. Um, number two, if we could just uh, briefly remember that the slowing down of the breath means um, the focus here, but it doesn't mean it's only one way that you breathe through your heart. You can, you can um, experiment with it and find what works for you. What I like to do and what I find to be very effective is a combination of ujjayi breath, which is a yogic breath, um, and a pranic breath that I've learned in my Kriya Yoga practice. And that is to um, imagine the breath coming in and out, kind of back and forth through my chest in the heart area. And so I draw in through my nostrils. I hold. And then I draw, um, I let the breath go out through my mouth in kind of a, a strong stream. So I'll demonstrate that. So what I'm I'm feeling and, and kind of sensing and even seeing with my um, kind of inside vision is uh, a stream of energy uh, that's flowing back and forth, not just in front of my heart, but also through uh, my chest, sort of like maybe those of you who are familiar with the chakra system, there's a funnel that goes out in front um, from your heart and there's a funnel that that um, comes out the back it's um, 
It's energetic and it also is connected to what she was describing as the electromagnetic field. Um, the torus is a, a very common shape for pretty much all uh, uh, living um, bodies, including the earth. And it's a field of energy. And so it's, it's a, it, it complements that toroidal field that she was talking about, um, the electromagnetic field around our heart, which is actually unique uh, to our heart. We also have a um, electromagnetic field around our entire physical form, which is um, with which the heart field is um, nested and surrounds and permeates and even maybe expands the entirety of that field, but it, it it's unique to the heart. So if I'm making sense, hopefully we have um, a field around our heart. And in addition, we have a field around our entire physical form. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. We'll continue. I hope you're enjoying this video. Thanks. And just by doing that, it helps create quick coherence, okay? Sorry, excuse me, I'm a little parched over here. Okay, let's go to the next one. So this one's also pretty simple, only three steps. Um, but this one is like a longer practice traditionally, like they may do this for like 15 minutes or something, but it's very similar to the other one. So they say this helps amplify the power of your heart and strengthen the connection between heart and brain, okay? so. You kind of just start the same way. You, you focus on your heart. You bring up a feeling of care and appreciation or something positive, And then you stay with it for five to 15 minutes, right? So just keep that fresh in your mind for like a while, okay? You gotta lock it in. And then toward the end, kind of like a loving kindness practice, you just send that feeling of love and appreciation out toward others. So imagine people you're sending it out to. So that's the extra little twist on this one. But this one, again, takes longer than the other one. Okay, freeze frame technique. So um, stock's kind of similar, um, but you know this one's designed to like, does help you stop and consult the wisdom of your heart before making a decision so you could act with your wise mind, okay? Oops. So there's some heart intelligence. Remember, it communicates to your brain, right? So I'm gonna start the same way. Shift out of your head and focus on your heart. Then you're gonna recall some positivity, right? Kind of feel it, bring it back. And now with that positivity there, okay? You start to ask your heart what to do in a challenging situation that you're experiencing now, right? So don't just guess the answer. Don't like implant the answer there. Just ask the question and see what arises. So like, what can I do in this situation to make it different? Or what can I do to minimize stress? And just listen and see what your heart has to say. All right. Sometimes something just pops in your mind, but you didn't fabricate it at all. It just kind of comes to you. And that's basically the freeze frame technique. OK. All right. Next is um, a little longer. There's more steps in this one. This is the cut through technique. All right. So it helps. They say shift your emotional state from over care to care. OK. So ever get in a situation where you feel like you probably care way more than you should or you're too invested in something. And so it's creating stress because you're like worrying about it too much or you're trying to fix something or fix someone, okay? So that's what he calls overcare, all right? So basically this one's about dialing it back. So it's a more wise mind level of just caring, but not like, oh, I gotta fix it, you know, <laughs> like that kind of thing. All right, so here's the steps. So first, just become aware of how you feel about the issue at hand, okay? Bring it to mind, just go through it, Think about how you're feeling. Step two, breathing love and appreciation through your heart, kind of like the other ones, right? You're kind of getting that feeling of, you know, positive feelings going. Then go back to the issue, right? With a more objectivity, all right? So now that we bring up these positive feelings, how could I just, you know, think about it as if it's someone else's problem, not my problem, like more in a neutral kind of a way and try to just stay in that neutral feeling for a little while, okay? And then instead of just being neutral, you're gonna layer some compassion on top of that problem, right? So feel compassion toward yourself and the situation and your feelings and kind of surround it and soak it in with the compassion, okay? And while you're doing that, they say like, just dissolve the significance of the issue a little at the time. So care a little bit less, right? Get a little less invested 
as you're surrounding your, your issue with the compassion, okay? And then, kind of like that other technique we just talked about, ask your heart for guidance about the issue, right? Just ask it the question and see what comes up, okay? So that's basically the cut through technique. Take a right hand, shake it out. How many people here want to learn faster? How many people want to remember more? <laughs> yeah? What? I forgot there was an ad there. Okay. Um, so here's some resources. Okay. So there's a website called heartmath.com, and they have a bunch of different stuff on there, including training um, for, for, for professionals and like places where you can go to get more heart math. Uh, stuff yourself, like some professionals do it with you and things like that. Um, but you could also do it yourself. And on the right, they actually, like I put a screenshot here, they sell a variety of products that you could just do on your own if you really wanted to. It's like a biofeedback thing. Like you clip something on your earlobe and you hook it up to your smartphone or your device and it helps to tell you if you're getting coherent or not. And so with that biofeedback, it helps teach you how to do it. Okay, so if you really want to get into it, you could try something like that, okay? You don't even necessarily have to see a professional. Or you could just do the, the practices I was just telling you about. And, you know, you probably could get coherent on your own just doing that. But if you really want to get more serious, you know, you could buy one of these things. Um, I have read the book on the left, The Heart Math Solution, which is one of the earlier books about it that they, they wrote, um, the founders wrote, and talk about the whole process and the science and all that kind of stuff. Um, it also talks about the exercises that I just told you about. Um, but there's also like a whole bunch of other books about heart math too. And the website lists all the books. I just can't personally vouch for them because I only read this one. Okay, so there's these, these different ways of finding out more. And right now, um, there's a guy named Roland McCready, and he's now head of the Heart Math Institute. So if you Google him, he has some videos on YouTube where he talks about heart math. I mean, there's other people too, but he's like the main guy. And, uh, you know, he's pretty interesting to talk to. So um, you can check him out if you want. All right. So um, hope that gets your heart going. Okay. It gets you a little bit more heartful. Um, add to your mindfulness. You can get more coherent, um, more um, emotionally regulated, cognitively regulated. Okay. So it's a free technique. It's easy. It's no side effects. Why not? <laughs> okay. So I hope you guys have fun with this one and uh, see you soon. All right. So that was quite something. And um, those practices that she mentions are going to be a part of our weekly practice together. Um, and at the conclusion of our time together today, I'm going to take a quick survey to see which one you'd like to dive into first next week. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'd like to take a moment before we go into uh, our slide deck again today to invite us to reflect on what we've just heard and learned or revisited. Um, at, I wondered if uh, anyone might like to share uh, on this prompt. Um, what are you experiencing, observing, considering about how heart coherence in self can impact others? What are you experiencing, observing, possibly considering, about how heart coherence in oneself can impact others. And of course, that's an invitation. If there's something else you might like to share um, about what you've just um, heard, please do. Ron, I see your hand going up. Hi, good morning, Molly. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's nice to be here. Um, yes, wow. Uh, the, I heard somebody say, like, drinking from a fire hose. There's so <laughs> much information in all this. Um, so considering, yeah. So I was thinking about the guys in my group out at the prison, you know, and how valuable this is and how I'd like to sh be able to share this with others. And, um, you know, being in a circle 
uh, when we meet how uh, the value of all this, if we can all kind of resonate the same frequency, so to speak, that uh, there's a real uh, connection and a real opportunity for sharing and and uh, becoming known. Um, so uh, I'm I'm envious of this young lady's ability. She obviously embodies this practice and embodies this knowledge and embodies this uh, this uh, wonderful wisdom. And I would hope someday to get to get to uh, a, a place where that uh, kind of echoes through me. So that's what went through my head. Thanks, Molly. You're on. Um, in working with school personnel, teachers, educators, uh, we are always promoting the connect before you redirect, co-regulate with your kids before you try to solve a problem with them or try to get them to change something that they're doing, is to make that grounding kind of connection first and get them to a place of calm. And we're always talking about co-regulating with them to help that happen. This puts some visuals kind of behind what that looks like. Uh, with the with the fields around it, I would like to take some of those those shots and share those with our educators, so they kind of have that picture in their own head as they are doing the co regulating as they're calming down and, and creating a calm space for this for the youngster before they start into problem solving. Mm. Wonderful, and I'm I'm curious, um, Carolyn and and everyone, how many of you have before have seen before that diagram of the um, the electromagnetic field around our heart, around our entire physical form. So it's it's pretty well known, right? But but um, if I'm hearing you correctly, it the the visual helps to put kind of yeah to register a bit more, <laughs> yeah. And did you notice that um, uh, Dr. Jennifer uh, was citing from the the study that I posted on the Padlet? Some of like the the, the boy and his dog, and some of the um, test studies of how a person can come in not knowing a thing about heart coherence, and with those three trained professionals um, in coherence, uh, just simply by being in their presence. Um, things shift. And that is an actual scientific study, which <laughs> I, I just get so geeky and excited about. I, I, I love working at the Institute of Noetic Science for that reason, um, because it, you know, it's a big aha moment. <laughs> and my curiosity really is, um, does it require three people? Or does it even require maybe just one? one person in coherence. What is the impact of one person in coherence on people who um, may not have any idea what that means? And is it a proximal thing or can it happen anywhere? Anyone else care to share on that prompt? And I, I'm happy to put the, prompt in, uh, the prompts in the chat. I think uh, being intentional about the the coherence with the, the person you're speaking with, even if you're not, like we are not physically within eight to nine feet of each other, um, but doing a, a practice like we've done, you know, so it may be more out, outward and intentional. I have a, a spiritual director that lives you know a state away from me but she always you know starts our and ends our sessions you know with quiet and with that that kind of a, a coherence and i noticed you know what a what a big difference that makes in the ability to have conversations of depth so i think that that's a, um it's it's interesting to think about how just the physical proximity and i think that's true um 
Yeah. Happen. Like I think the having the, the animal that's not, obviously not speaking, but the pet in your presence and how that can. And we've we, with those of us that use therapy dogs, you know, see that see that happen with our clients when you you have a dog in the room, how that changes. It changes people um, without that dog ever, you know, doing anything outward or intentional. But but sometimes we need to be more intentional, I guess. Wondering if it's just me that sees Kendall with the magenta aura, or if that's if everybody sees that. What what was your uh, 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 oh, the, everybody, the, or, the energy the aura? <laughs> does everybody see Kendall yeah. with a magenta aura? <laughs> oh, there we go. That was perfect. <laughs> okay. Is it back now? Is it back to normal now? Okay, that that just happens sometimes. It must be my electromagnetic field has some quirk in it. I guess I, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, Christine, did you have anything else that you wanted to share? I, I actually had something that I didn't want to talk over. Um, no, I think I just uh, I love this idea of um our heart being so much bigger than what's in our body and our mind the same, right? That you know that you can feel energy when you walk into a room. Mm. And um, so if we can pay attention to that and set intention to it, what a difference we can make um, both in the work that we do and the people that we connect with. I love I just love that intention came into the space. Thank you, Christine, Kendall, and Carolyn. I think you mentioned it too. And probably it's on everybody's heart and mind. Um, there seems to be quite an extraordinary power that we have. And I believe Dr. Wayne Dyer really just looked into it with his work. Um, but that intention has the ability to bend um, to some degree, uh, the outcomes or the spaces themselves. And so being intentional actually has that scientific power to, uh, you know, whether we need to know that it's scientific or not is really a personal thing. But I've noticed that um, intention and attention, those two combined have a lot of, of uh, oomph behind them. <laughs> Um, and I, I wanted to just come back to the, to the mention, Kendall, that you made of therapy dogs. Uh, I, I probably shouldn't get started on that topic because I just get so excited. <laughs> but I do want to mention that if you, anyone is interested in um, therapy dogs and restorative justice, I have the privilege and honor of having worked with uh, the author of Pause for Peace, um, which is a little, it's just a, a very thin volume, but it's packed with information on how to integrate restorative justice with, uh, of any kind, practices in any pocket of our society um, with uh, ther therapy dogs and how to do that. So it's, it's practical. It also points to what Kendall, you just mentioned that there is um, an inherent regulatory quality that um, I think we all know, you know, I mean, some of us of course may not be dog lovers um, or animal lovers and that's perfectly all right, um, which is, uh, is part of when we do have therapy dogs in programs, we always ask permission, which permission and voluntary are one of the key foundational values and practices of this work at every step of the way with the people that we work with we're we're doing the very best we can to signal that in the unspoken as well as in our actual policies and practices with our clients with our students um, but therapy dogs i've 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 actually sat in conferences pre conferences as well as full conferences 
with therapy dogs. And it is uh, quite something because it does absolutely shift the environment in higher intensity cases. Um, and again, with the permission of the clients. Um, if you want a full video or information that comes directly from the author, pa uh, Patricia Latai, who actually lives uh, just a few blocks from me here. It's funny. We're, we're connected in many ways in this RJ work that we've been doing. Um, please let me know because it's a, it's a resource that is in our archives that just hasn't been posted clearly yet. Um, but it, it can be shared. Can anyway, you add that to our resources I that you get to do? I okay. certainly can. Let me make a note of sure. that. Quick. And, how, and how do you spell Patricia Latai's last name? Um, it's French. Uh, La Thai, which means the, uh, the size, like the size of things. Um, so it's L-A-T-A-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. And I can put that in the Padlet. And I'll definitely post the actual video um, on our Padlet as well. So Patricia Latai. And she really, I, I feel, honestly, I've, I've looked for other people doing like implementation work with therapy dogs and who have published a book and I haven't found anybody. Um, so I believe she may very well be the first um guide and way shower and author who has implemented therapy dogs in court program and schools um i'm sure there's other people doing it but i just don't know about them i know that her work has influenced others to begin which i hope that continues i'm, I'm sure it will um, any other thoughts? An observation i go ahead <laughs> Um, I grew up working on a horse farm yes. and uh, the woman who yes. was in charge of the horses, she would always assign me to go and hold the horses uh, you know, bridle while they were getting shooed by the, because some of them were nervous and skittish or whatever, because I could calm them down just by standing there. And so she would assign me to do those things. And of course, you know, if you, anybody who's worked with horses or whatever, your body language and your, whether your muscles are tense or relaxed, all of that sends messages directly to the the horse but you don't even have to be on the horse you don't have to be touching the horse to get to get that calm co-regulation or coherence whichever you want to call it and um i've taken lots of graduate work of course and and working with children with behavior conditions and disorders and all kinds of things and i always have said in everything i've done all the professional development i've done i i learned more from working on the horse farm than i learned in any of my graduate classes just the how do you how do you just send the message that we're going to get to a calm space together. We're going to ground each other, and then we're going to work on whatever needs to get worked on. Uh, and, and just so I've been, I've been preaching that in a lot of ways, in a lot of places that it, it comes from inside here, not just the words you're saying, obviously. And it, and it crosses species <laughs> it does. quite readily. Oh, thank you so um, much for that, Carolyn. Mm -hmm. That is such a beautiful point, and I love that you bring up horses. Um, I, know, I know we have slides to get to, but this is a really rich conversation to have right now. Um, the, uh, did you take EFL by any chance, equine facilitated learning? PDs? It didn't even exist when I was a youngster and, you know, I'm yeah. <laughs> approaching 70. Okay. So it didn't exist, but it existed in the mind of the woman who ran the horse farm that I worked on yeah. in right. the sense that she got yeah. it totally right. before it was ever a thing that anybody right. named. Uh, she just knew it, and um, and we knew it too. I mean, she made it clear to us that we were sending messages all the time to the animals around us, and not just the horses, you know, the cats and dogs and everything that was on them. Yeah. Exactly. So that question is something that I would love for us to put a pin in and keep with us as we move together of uh, what is that? What What is that communication? And does that link to what we heard from Dr. Jennifer today, and um, how how can we bring that forward in a in a way that supports each other to speak to it clearly to the people that we're working with, 
um, because I'm my my guess is 99% of people would feel after they get through that maybe slight wall of skepticism or uh, misunderstanding about what it is um, be completely changed by it. Um, and I, I my um, late colleague who uh, was in restorative justice for a good portion of her adult life um, from Minnesota, Chris Miner um, and South Dakota, um, was actually doing EFL and restorative justice work. Um, and bless her heart, I, she's deep, deeply missed in this field. Uh, but but she was starting to really bring the two together. And I've looked at doing that myself as an equestrian, um, knowing that a horse picks up on if you're in coherence or not. They absolutely do. And I, uh, in my riding recently in the last year, I was working with a, um, um, a woman who has a huge ranch um, not far from here. And one of her horses she had me um, take him on a trail ride and um, he, he had a bad habit of uh, getting really nervous and triggered in certain locations um, and certainly a bad habit about like getting completely um, like kicky and wanting to buck me off on the way home to the barn. <laughs> so as soon as we turned the corner, the horse, you know, of course they know they are so intelligent. And as soon as we turn the corner down the trail back to the stable and main grounds, of course he knew. And so he started to try and like get me off of his back. And I, I just engaged in my heart coherence and kept a gentle touch on the reins. And, um, you know, that actually helped him to also cohere and to correct the, um, you know, the need for, for galloping and bucking all the way home. And, you know, there's many instances of that. And uh, the reason why it's important, of course, links to what we're beginning to learn and um, grasp around how coherence uh, not just impacts other human beings, but all beings. And likewise, uh, I have another story about a, a cow in Austria for another time that I just, we, we did a, a little experiment, my friend and I, um, with a cow who is prone to attack and, you know, kind of be um, uh, not friendly with people, but I'll tell that story some other time. Um, anyone else have anything to add um, before we take the last 15 minutes today to, to just to look into um, the slides that we have? ongoing. I just want to quickly say that uh, so much of what we're talking about uh, illuminates or resonates with, you know, the Indigenous teachings, which is the world I live in, um, and that we are all medicine or medicine in our own lives and in the lives of each other. And it isn't, uh, it, it, it isn't just about acts of kindness, because kindness is one of the four laws in, well, I'm in Cree country in Alberta, um, but that's one of the four laws is uh, kindness. And uh, in fact, my, my son would say the colonizers broke the first law, which is love. Anyway, when they came and took the children away. Um, but being medicine with each other is not just about acts of kindness, but it's about creating a collective space where we feel each other's energy. And when we all went on, on the line, during COVID, uh, it became very convenient for, I, I teach social work in a university and it, it was very convenient for us to be online. And some people actually got to like it because you didn't have to travel, you didn't, you know, all, all the uh, the benefits of that. But, but we kept having conversations about the loss of that collective space is that we need to be together to lift each other up through the energy that we share. And we have a responsibility to contribute to a healthy collective space. And I only become who I am meant to be, intended to be, uh, by being in that collective space in a good way. 
So we we have a lot of teachings around intention. We open many of our all of our days and and most of our meetings, workshops, whatever, with prayer. And I remind people that this is the this is the time for pause to uh, ground ourselves in our intention to be together in a good way for the work that we're or the discussion or whatever it is we're about to do. And the same thing happens in ceremony is that that grounding happens uh, before we do the collective activity, right? So, so, so much of what you're talking about just really resonates and I'm happy to be listening. If I'm not as actively contributing my voice, I apologize. I'm just going through some, I don't, whatever, some back pain has emerged for no reason. I didn't hurt myself, but I'm, I'm uh, <laughs> just being quiet and mindful today. And I uh, appreciate that I can participate uh, and and hear what's happening. So thank you. Sharon, thank you so much. I, I learned something every time you're willing to share. And uh, I I just have so much respect and care for um, for you and for what you've shared thus far in this short time together. Um, and I, I feel very humbled and also uh, responsible to keep my heart and mind on um, the original wisdom and knowledge that that you're speaking to and the practices as well as, you know, um, the responsibility that we still have. You know, one of my friends um, and teachers of many uh, are indigenous people from various backgrounds. Um, Edward Valandra, um, you know, he, he asks, um, well, how can we really do restorative justice? How can you all, you know, as Wasichu, do restorative justice if uh, the first harm is is sitting there um, unattended to? So how can we even really go about being and doing something restorative it, when we're ignoring something that is so glaring? And I I live with that. Uh, I don't know the answer. I I I, I know what my personal take on that is um, and continue to work with that. But I think it's a very important question. And I have so much respect for uh, and want to be careful about not being, uh, you know, disrespectful or co-opting or any of those things. Um, and every day when I run up the hill, I'm thinking about the you people and thanking them and apologizing to them actually for uh, for our lack of consciousness around um, these lands, for the utter greed that is going on because we're considered a resort town um, and for, for a prayer that we wake up before it's too late and can actually repair those harms because it would do us well to listen to the teachings and to the, 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 the teachings that are actually just simply, I think, from what I can tell, ways of being um, that have been whitewashed and uh, eradicated from this continent um, by design for, for um, uh, very, very unfortunate reasons, um, very, very, unfortunate reasons which is an understatement um so that is uh probably all i can really share about that right now um so that we have time to come back to our slides and look at restorative justice <laughs> with all that said um and how it connects to the practices that that we um, are looking at and uh, wanting to bring forward again, uh, and I and I think it's so important to to keep in our hearts and minds the um, the humility and 
and the openness to where where this really comes from. These these of course, as Sharon is in her resonance and wisdom is sharing, come from some somewhere and um, um, from very careful handing down of oral traditions and practices that just are a way of being. Um, and I hope that we can can make things right before it's too late. And I hope that they that in America and and other countries across the globe that have been impacted by colonialism, that we can truly, by these simple practices alone, open up a whole new field of healing and of acknowledgement. So when um, when we were together last, I was hoping to help us visualize this bridge between um, heart coherence, of course, and restorative practices. And we looked at the three R's from Howard Zer, which I know most of you, if, if not all of us are very familiar. Um, but even now, after all of these years um, studying and practicing and writing and researching in this field, I learned something new about these words and about how they translate into practice. And so that's why we look, we return to them um, again and again, as Kate Pranis uh, often encourages us almost all the time, every time I've talked with her personally or in a learning um, community space like this, she invites people to come back to the values again and again together because really um, we could do many, many circle or conference connection processes that are even non-conflict related just to just to find out what these things mean to each other. And I know a lot of us are in um, diversity, equity, and inclusion spaces. And if we don't have non-conflict conversations that are um, inquiries about what these pieces mean, um, what are we doing really? Um, and how can, how can we really go forward um, as one, as Sharon was just referring to, our, make, bringing our minds and hearts together as one. Um, we can't do that if we're saying to someone that I, I'm, this is a respectful space. We, we need to invite that inquiry together. And, um, and this is how um, coming together restoratively is um, in good portion non-conflict oriented before we're even going into facilitating uh, a case, for example, in a school or alongside a court. We're, we're coming together as a staff to look at these pieces and to find ways um, to improve our ability to be authentic in our three breath practice together. You know, that's such a beautiful practice that you shared, Carolyn, and um, it's so simple. And I, it, it recalled for me a time when um, I was in the office with my, with, with our team together and really wanting more than anything to help remove the, that unspoken sense of stress and tension in the room and um, offering this practice, uh, but to no avail really. And, um, you know, there's times when it feels like offering these practices, uh, you know, there's there's something uh, deeper in the way and um, and and such that uh, it prevents us from really feeling that it's been authentically shared together. And that's normal because, I mean, I, I don't want to say that that we want to adopt that as a normalized thing, but rather we want to just observe that that might be the case. And to continue to be devoted to doing brief practices together and to inquiry together. Um, if you're in a leadership position, even more so, to just stay dedicated to a practice such as this. If you're a director of a, an RJ um, team on a school campus, um, stay dedicated and stick with it and um, just 
you know, make sure to, to not um, overjudge if it doesn't feel authentic at, at the beginning, because there, there are, there are um, tensions and stressors that, that each of us bring in. And the more that, that you can bring something um, from these practices into that space on a consistent basis, I, I believe almost 100% you're gonna see change over time. So, so consistency and um, navigation of the ups and downs of what your team will be bringing in. Um, you know, that, that even simply by just having that one time um, each morning uh, or on a weekly basis at your staff meeting, um, and then in preparation for your work with your clients. Consistency over time. And so we looked at, at how um, the value of connection and relationship really interlinks with heart coherence practice. As, as we know, we biomagnetically communicate and we saw today evidence um, visually again of uh, from heart mouth and from Dr. Jen about how that is true um, and that our state of coherence enhances and can or can detract others coherence right so we're um, what fires together wires together um, that's a neuroscientific phrase I think from Daniel Goleman um, our heart rhythms can synchronize um, as shown by those samples from studies done um, that are also in your PDF. So nonverbal communication is equally potent to verbal. We transmit values without speaking. We can convey states of increasing trust. Um, we can build a truly safe container together from the foundation of these practices. Um, and of course, the responsibility that we have is it's an honor. I feel, and it's also um, can be daunting. But if we ourselves are practicing, um, we can re we can uh, bring forward our best capacity and best self as much as possible. And when we when we go off center or get frazzled um, and frayed by something we know and are capacitated to come back to that state of coherence more and more. Um, remember, I was talking about that foundation that we're building uh, that we can activate on the fly. So these studies uh, that were cited today, uh, they prove that personal coherence significantly increases our ability to navigate stressful situations with calm and presence. And Dr. Jen um, talked about that. Uh, two, our ability to transmit and receive metaverbal information from others. So metaverbal, um, you might have noticed in if you've been sitting in a conference or a circle or even online in this these spaces, that perhaps you'll be thinking of something that, that seems really significant and alive for you um, that might want to be brought to the verbal realm, but you haven't done that yet. And um, someone actually offers almost the same thing before you say it. Um, so someone will say something that you were thinking of as significant and important. This is what we call the group field. Um, and it is real in these processes. There, there is something about um, joining together where two or more are gathered um, that this science backs up that we have the ability to strengthen our wisdom and help uplift each other, as Sharon was saying, um, in a way that has a better shot at coming to um, the wisdom of, uh, it's also called the wisdom of the circle. You've probably heard that. Um, and it gives us a better shot at complete exhaustion of sorts of the, um, of the tension, of the uh, unspoken nonverbal biases or assumptions that are often very much alive in conflict, right? Um, so coupled with the verbal expression 
of the context of a story that perhaps the victim and offender didn't know of one another. That's a biggie. When those stories come to verbal um, and are held in a conscientious way, it can very much help there to be an exhaustion of the tension and energy of assumption and of um, judgment that, that is being transmitted in the nonverbal. And of course, we know we have that ability to impact others' coherence, thanks to these studies that are cited in the report. Uh, and I also did, uh, I believe, link to the Institute, uh, or excuse me, the National Library of Medicine, um, Cardiac Coherence, Self-Regulation, Autonomic Stability, and Psychosocial Well-Being <laughs> um, from 2014. That's a complimentary report also that you might find interesting if you haven't already looked. And we'll round out today um, just, uh, again, this is kind of a already been stated, but just to synopse, um, facilitators who have a consistent coherence practice and build it in themselves are more likely to be able to support and help navigate any type of conflict, often into surprising transformation, which is what we've been talking about. Um, Number two, facilitators have nonverbal or metaverbal energetic communication that can and does influence regulation and insight in others. Insight, meaning what I just mentioned about bringing to the surface the contextual or the story that may be unseen as of yet. I have seen it again and again when these come to the surface and are spoken to and told that aha moments go on in the receiver or also known as victim, as well as in the offender, better known as author, um, the person who caused harm. When these pieces come to the light and are um, spoken to, because we've held that ability um, in the ways that we've held of coherence and regulation, this, um, this is one of the largest factors of um, truly going all the way into the transformative energy um, space. And it's not a means to an end, of course, but it is something very, very much um, at the marrow of conflict transformation of any kind. And I mean, I don't know much of anything. I know a lot, but nothing. <laughs> I would love to see studies on that very thing um, that, that uh, of these pieces uh, that we know are there in this work, but haven't really been spoken to or written on or researched. So to speak to the obvious, number three, <laughs> a well-held restorative dialogue of any kind, even, even non-conflict, begins with facilitator coherence, as well as team coherence, pre previous to any dialogic process. So um, there's many, many steps in approaching this work um, intentionally and conscientiously in our lives um, as we go about our, our non-professional lives, if there's any difference really in this work, uh, sometimes I wonder, um, that we're cohering ourselves. And when we're not coherent, we come back to it with ease because we're equipped and, and aware and intentional um, for our personal circumstances, as well as for any noticing any triggers um, and things that might take us out from center in doing this work. That's that's a, a big important piece because that helps us to really stay in our seat as a facilitator um, and notice, simply notice that, oh, wow, this is really bringing something up for me too. And that um, on a whole other note is if you notice that there's a case that's being presented for, for you and your team to bring uh, to, to take that is to an intake 
and you notice that it's maybe a little too close to home um, and you're the one working with your team to discern who might be the right facilitators for this particular scenario, you know, make sure that you're well equipped with a, a, a diverse variety of, of people who can sit um, together in facilitation, whether, whether it's conflict or non-conflict. Um, but th these are all the wonderful things that, that can come um, from this practice, helping our self-awareness um, become even more attuned so that we can truly be there as not a therapeutic process. Um, RJ is not therapy, but it has very many elements that do seem like they could go in that direction very easily and often do if we're not careful. So. Um, it's a it's a very interesting line that um, that I don't have any easy answers for, and I know we're over time, um, but I'd love to see. I want to find the quote. Um, hmm. These are quotes that are really important um, that I'll give give to you. I wanted to go back one here. The results of these experiments have led us to conclude that the nervous system acts as an antenna, which is tuned to and responds to the magnetic fields produced by the hearts of other individuals. My colleagues and I call this energetic information exchange, energetic communication awareness, and mediates important aspects of true empathy and sensitivity to others. Furthermore, we have observed that this energetic communication ability can be enhanced, resulting in a much deeper level of nonverbal communication, understanding, and connection between people. We also propose that this type of energetic communication between individuals may play a role in therapeutic interactions between clinicians and patients that has the potential to promote the healing process. So just replace therapeutic um, process with restorative process, right? Um, in that last sentence, I truly believe that the, and I'm not the only one, um, that the nonverbal realm, which is very directly a part of this whole series and this whole purpose here of heart coherence, is the key um, to improving and growing exponentially in how we do restorative practices, um, how we are ourselves, how we are with others, and how we can serve optimally. So uh, we'll stop there for today, but let uh, if you would like to stay for two more minutes, um, let's open up for any comments, questions, anything else. And if not, we certainly will gather again next week for session three and this recording will be posted. Um, it takes a little bit of time to upload it to YouTube, but not too much time. It'll be there soon, um, like by tomorrow. Thank you. So thank, thank you. Everyone. And, Thanks everyone. Uh, peace, peace. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'm feeling a lot of appreciation. Thank you. But there's a lot to think about. Really? <laughs> wow. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> That's good. Next week. Right. Talk to you guys later. Bye.